We are almost there and it's 2 p.m. And it looks like I have 40 minutes. So that's something like 35 minutes for the talk itself and five minutes for questions. But I will be also available afterwards. So it's a, it's a mostly high level talk, uh, but afterwards feel free to, to come and find me even here or, or outside and uh, we can have a discussion on, on any of these topics in, uh, in greater detail. All right, so um, hello everyone. Thank you for uh, joining me. And this session will be about cakes to some extent uh, or a cake. Um, what I will be showing you is basically multiple layers that you can use to build a modern cloud native stack that can solve all of your application networking challenges that you might have in Kubernetes. Uh, who is using Kubernetes, by the way, from, from this audience? Oh, almost everyone. That's, that's great. There are some conferences when uh, not many people are using Kubernetes, and after that point, uh, the, the talk is a bit different. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, my name is Christian Fekete. Uh, I'm working at solo.io um, as a field engineer and software engineer. Um, you can see my contact information on the slide, so feel free to um, send me an email or reach out on any, on, on any of these if you have uh, any follow-up questions afterwards. Uh, who is familiar with solo.io, by the way? Not a single person. Okay, everyone's using Kubernetes, not everyone's familiar with, with solo.io. That's interesting. All right, so we are an application networking company. We are solving application networking challenges. Um, we have built solutions based on and on top of um, open source cloud native projects. Uh, most of them, all of them are part of the CNCF. And uh, we are adding additional enterprise capabilities uh, into, into our offering. But as I mentioned, the actual core of our software is, is always open source. Uh, we have many customers, um, and uh, you can see a brief intro on what kind of technologies we are using. You can see Istio, Envoy, Kubernetes, Cilium. We will be talking about those when we are taking a look at the uh, layer uh, in the presentation itself. This is the agenda for today. Nothing really complex. First, I, I will talk a uh, very tiny bit about uh, platform engineering, why platform engineering can be interesting or important, or why someone um, in our experience at Solo, why some of our customers are uh, adopting that model. Then I will be showing you the the, the, uh, the cloud native uh, networking stack that I um, that I want to show you. We will be going layer by layer and um, get familiar with all these components and how these can work together. What are the trade-offs? Um, that will be the uh, most exciting part of the presentation, I think. Then we will have a summary and, uh, and that's it. All right. This is my first slide. Software is a differentiator. If you are working at any kind of companies nowadays, most probably the company itself is building software in one way or, not, or another. Um, you might not be working for an actual tech company. You might not be working for Google, um, Amazon, Netflix, all these other, all these big tech companies. But even if you are working for a web shop or any kind of other uh, enterprise nowadays, it's very likely that your business is that your business depends on how you are doing software. And the software that you are building, shipping, is, is actually a different a differentiator. Let's say, let's um, go back to the webshop example. You are working at a e-commerce website. Uh, then you most probably have a web application, or a web app, or, um, or a mobile application that your users can use to, to order something from your, from your store. If they have a not so great experience using your application, then they might go to a competitor. So you can see that how software is really important nowadays. Um, this is my second slide. Uh, how you do software uh, is also a differentiator. 
not just the software itself, but how you are uh, deploying it. Let's say, again, webshop example, you are working there, you are doing some, let's say, ops related, um, ops -related uh, job there. That can be, I don't know, platform team, DevOps team, or an end-to-end -end, uh, dev team even. Uh, and you realize that there's a bug and you need to uh, roll back uh, the latest version of the software. In that case, how you do software is also can be a differentiator. How fast can you roll back the version that has the bug? How fast you can you can patch it on the fly? How, how fast you can even just notice that, okay, something is wrong in an application. All of these are, are differentiators. And uh, if someone get, doesn't get this right, then uh, their business, uh, then they might uh, miss out on some business. And this is the last uh, iteration on this uh, initial thought. How people are feeling when building and using software as a differentiator. And I think this includes both the people working at a certain company and building the software themselves and shipping that software and patching that and providing on-call and all these, all these responsibilities that, that come with it. And uh, how people are feeling about this process itself. Because if, for example, let's say the observability is in a good shape at your company and you are able to notice that, okay, I don't know, 67% of our use, uh, users are, are getting 5xx um, uh, response codes on a certain day. Then you are already better than, than some because you were able to um, notice this and uh, you, someone from your team or from other teams might already be working on fixing that problem. But the process uh, that led to led you to notice that something was wrong is also can be a differentiator because if people are not happy with the tooling that they have, um, they might not like to work at that company. They might try to change things. If they cannot change things, they might even leave. Uh, nowadays, it's not many people are leaving uh, right away for reasons like this. Um, but all these frustration can build up into something that will also cause the actual uh, company to miss out on some business. And obviously the other end, the client side, if you cannot use a website or it looks like from your perspe perspective that um, the software that you are using and the company behind that, the people managing that um, application, if for, uh, from your perspective, it doesn't even look like that they are aware of a problem when there's clearly a problem, then uh, just like I mentioned before, you might also uh, start to get frustrated uh, with the given um, software that you are using. There can be lots of different reasons why problems like this can, can occur. Um, but nowadays, everyone is doing a migration. Uh, can I see the hands of the people who are doing a migration at the moment? Let's say cloud migration. It can be in any, any direction because nowadays people are also migrating away from the cloud. But uh, yeah, there's, there's definitely some people who are doing, uh, doing uh, some kind of migration. It's been like this for the last couple of, I don't know, years at least, five years, 10 years, I don't know. Um, and during migration, you can take a look at the um, the baseline where you are starting out when you are starting the actual migration, and you can have as a goal something something very nice. Let's say you are moving to the cloud, you want to embrace Kubernetes. So, optimally, your end target is that every everything will be running on Kubernetes, and everything will will be just fine. From that point, everything will be perfect. You will be happy. Uh, the software will be will be great, and uh, the business will be also much better than before. Um, but usually migrations are not that easy. Uh, as I mentioned, we are working in application networking and we see we have witnessed lots of lots of migrations because usually we are talking with people who are either considering migrating or they are starting a greenfield project and they need a new cloud native infrastructure for that. So they reach out uh, to us and we have, a, uh, we have a session with them to understand what are their pain points, what are their challenges. Um, this is how migration goes, but 
migrations are usually uh, takes a while and uh, even after the migration is let's say finished usually even after the finished migration you still have some kind of legacy still running you still have some vms you still have some i don't know cobol maybe maybe not but you still have some something that you for any any kind of reason are not able to uh, ship to the new infrastructure which was your original um, end goal if you have this situation and i think most migrations are like this and people have this situation then problems can can occur let's say people are more familiar with the old uh, technology that they were using or they are familiar with the tools that they use to manage the uh, the previous technology that they are migrating away from um, you have traditionally um, teams that are more like silos so for example you have the security team you have the uh, the NOC team uh, for first level of um, networking related um, support then you have the dev, dev teams you can have another ops team and these are silos and they are all used to work with their original tooling and bridging the gap between these silos and uh, having a consistent tooling can be challenging and usually something that people don't necessarily uh, focus too much uh, during during a migration um related to this they might have yesterday's tools to solve these problems for example back in the day everyone was using i don't know tcp dump or ip tables which are perfectly fine you can still use them but uh, who has anyone used tcp dump in a kubernetes uh, infrastructure i could see one hand um, i know many people who have used that they didn't necessarily have a good experience because those tools were not created uh, for for today's tooling just like with ip tables there's a new generation of engineers who are not really familiar with ip tables what they are used for why should i even care about them um, so this can also uh, lead to friction and as i mentioned developer uh, experience ops experience not sure if that's a phrase uh, i just made that up uh, a couple of minutes before the presentation and the user experience uh, is can be also bad so this is why platform engineering um, uh, can help because platform engineering this is the official definition from platformengineering.org i think um, i should i should uh, fix the source uh, annotation so this is basically providing a unified and consistent workflow and tool chain and tool set for everyone in the organization so that they can have a platform when they have a paid road to to success um, if you take this to another level uh, it can provide also self-service capabilities so all of your developer teams can use the platform itself to do their job basically security team can also leverage this uh, platform to for example find access logs for their audit purposes um, this is from uh, another web website that is showing the platform tooling landscape you can see that it's quite uh, quite detailed it's not as detailed as the cncf uh, landscape but it's quite similar uh, you can see that there are lots of solutions and tools uh, to to cherry pick when you are building out a platform like that um, so you can use the tools that i just showed you on the previous slide um, but as i mentioned people might be using especially during migration yesterday's tools for today's problem and our global field CTO Christian Posta, who was originally supposed to deliver this talk, but unfortunately he, he couldn't travel. Um, he couldn't travel uh, this week. Uh, wrote a great blog post on why full life uh, cycle API management is dead and what kind of shift uh, people should make how they should bring their APIs closer to the infrastructure and the tool set that they are operating to, to be more successful in a cloud native era. Um, you can just uh, take a screenshot and, or scan the uh, QR code and uh, read this uh, report. It's, uh, it's really interesting, I think. So after 10 minutes, um, what we will be going through in this talk uh, is the um, cloud native uh, networking stack that uh, our solutions are also uh, built upon um, 
it's called cake or cakes, depending on how many layers we include. You can see that the first is Cilium, then Ambient Mesh in Istio, Kubernetes, Envoy Proxy, and Spiffy Spire. Um, who, is, who is using Cilium um, from this audience? Okay, that's a couple of hands. Who is using Istio in any way? Okay, that's a couple more. Who is using Ambient maybe? Uh, have you tried Ambient already? Okay, someone is already, okay, I, I want to speak to you uh, after, the, <laughs> after, the, after the session. Uh, for those who might not be completely aware of what ambient mode is, uh, ambient mode is the sidecarless uh, mode in uh, Istio. Uh, you can have MTLS for free, you don't need to restart your applications, you won't have sidecars, you will just have the service mesh capabilities, observability at both layers uh, 4 and layer 7. I will be talk about, talking about that uh, later on. Kubernetes, I already asked lots of, um, basically almost everyone is a Kubernetes user. Envoy Proxy, who is running Envoy Proxy? There's a couple of people, all right. That's also not too bad. And Spiffy Spire, that's for identity management. Okay, there's, there's some, there's some. Usually that's, uh, that's the question that has the least amount of hands in the air after I have that. So let's go through this. Um, layers and see how they can help, how they can uh, work together and what kind of uh, problems they can solve. First, Kubernetes. I will be going through these first couple of slides quickly because most of you are a seasoned Kubernetes user, but uh, you can see what Kubernetes is. This is again official definition from kubernetes.io. It's a portable and extensible platform that you can uh, build upon. It has a growing ecosystem of tools that you can use to, to build your own platform, basically. It can manage your deployments. Um, it has really nice abstractions that can make your uh, life really easy, especially if you are aware of the pain points that were present before Kubernetes uh, came around uh, uh, many years ago. Um, for example, if you're, let's say you have a deployment with multiple replica, replicas, then Kubernetes itself and the control plane will make sure that you have a couple of uh, replicas running from that daemon set. You don't need to care about anymore which nodes uh, these will be running, because this is what the Kubernetes, um, Kubernetes control plane will do it for you do for you. Basically, it will allocate all of them. If you have an unhealthy node, it can drain the resources and workloads from those nodes. It's, uh, it's a really nice improvement in life if you are coming from a background before Kubernetes. What Kubernetes is not, and I didn't include this, uh, this is also again from uh, Kubernetes.io because we, will, we need to talk about what Kubernetes is not, but because this is where I think we can see one of the most important things about what Kubernetes actually is, and um, that's this. Kubernetes provides the building blocks for building developer platform, but preserves user choice and flexibility where it's important. And you will be seeing this exact line of thinking going through this whole presentation, and this is actually also uh, present in how we build our software and our platform um, that our customers are using because it's a great way to think about it. You should just provide the building blocks. The building blocks might be already there, but someone needs to glue these together and provide a unified experience and a single API and something that is really nice that can enable you to build uh, the software uh, that, you, uh, that you want uh, in a way you want. Next in the stack is Cilium. Uh, I already saw a couple of uh, hands uh, who are using uh, Cilium itself. Uh, if you are not familiar with Istio, this is a CNI. CNI is, as you could see, container network interface that provides basic connectivity between your pods uh, in your Kubernetes uh, cluster. Uh, it also includes a network policy layer, so you can say things like, I, do, I, do, I only want this pod or this application to talk to that other application. You can create Cilium specific policies. Kubernetes also provides some kind of policy layer, um, but Cilium provides an extension of that and that includes additional capabilities. 
Um, it's based on eBPF. This is one of the reasons why it's really popular because people like new shiny things and eBPF was a really nice and interesting shiny things before AI come around. There were conferences in 2022 when um, there were, I don't know, over 25% of the talks were, were eBPF related. Nowadays, with someone, this uh, popularity might be a bit um, smaller, but uh, eBPF is still exciting and, and a great technology for, uh, for lots of use cases. Uh, if you want to leverage it for networking uh, use cases, then you have to be running at a really large scale to really benefit from the performance improvements over IP tables or the standard Q proxy that is available in Kubernetes uh, based on our experience. Uh, but yeah, sure, if you are a cloud provider, then you most probably will need some kind of um, capabilities that uh, a platform like this can provide. Uh, there are other uh, features of Cilium as well, for example, observability. Um, as I mentioned, it can, um, it can, there, there are network policies, and if you say things like this pod cannot talk to that other pod, then you can use, for example, Hubble, which is a project a uh, side project in the Cilium ecosystem that you can use to visualize the flow logs. So you can see how traffic flows between your services and you can see that, okay, that uh, that that, uh, that traffic is, is dropped between two workloads. So something, uh, something is up. Um, there's a large community behind it. Uh, the creators are, are called Isovalent and they were acquired by, by Cisco last year. I think it was already last year. Uh, Time is, time is flying. Um, and if you are using any public cloud provider, then you very likely have an option for any new clusters that you might have to use a new kind of control plane. And that control, that control plane usually includes uh, Cilium in one way or another. Um, as I mentioned, originally Cilium is, was a CNI. Um, so it was great at layer four capabilities or layer three capabilities. It provided an easy and nice way to um, to to get IP addresses to your ports and uh, do the layer uh, layer four stuff. But the project also started to uh, move up in the stack. Uh, they started to cover ingress and east west use cases as well. There's a question of identity and MTLA, which is not MTLS, but it's quite close. It's mutual authentication because uh, Cilium as, as, as a project is doing MTLS a bit differently. Uh, and that results in that not being MTLS, but MTLA, which is, uh, which is a bit different. After the talk, I'm more than happy to dive into um, the details of how this is um, different. But this is actually tied to the f fact how Cilium is also handling identity because that's not actually a cryptographic identity. That's just an identity based on labels. And there can be situations in a Kubernetes cluster that that identity can be mistaken. So um, people should be aware of the uh, of the trade-offs when they want to use um, Cilium for, for everything. We think that Cilium is a great CNI and uh, probably the best CNI out there. Uh, but for, for other, for example, ingress and ESS use cases, there are projects that are more mature and, uh, and bulletproof and something that people are running in production at scale for, for many, many years. Next uh, stop, workload identity, Spiff Spire. Um, that's the official definition again from uh, from the website website itself. Uh, Spiffy is the actual uh, is the actual protocol, and Spire is a pro is a production and the implementation of Spiffy. What is really important is that it can provide cryptographic identities when the identity is part of the the certificate itself. Um, not many people necessarily know that, but um, Istio behind the scene also is using is also using um, uh, Spiffy uh, to to handle identity, and that's a great security posture. Uh, people and security teams are usually happy, uh, very happy with uh, with the security features that Istio can provide, because. The last thing most uh, security team wants to hear is that, okay, I will roll my own security. I will roll my own crypto. Uh, hey, there's this new MTLS and TLS is fine, but how about using something like MTLA? And the security team might start to ask questions righteously because um, these are the things that uh, people should not compromise on, I think. 
Um, lastly, as the as the big, biggest section, because this has the the most of the interesting and new um, things that I want to talk about, is uh, Istio and the ambient mode of Istio. This is a very simplified slide showing why ambient is a game changer in application networking and the, um, on top of Kubernetes. Um, the first thing is that it's sidecarless. So even though Kubernetes starting from 1.28, I think, has native su support for sidecars, which is great. Everyone was waiting for that. And uh, very funnily, ironically, right after the, the native sidecar support arrived, ambient mode also arrived. So, <laughs> uh, but there are other uh, sidecars uh, as well. It's just a fun funny coincidence that how the two overlapped uh, in time. So there are no sidecars. You don't need to inject your applications uh, and at scale, this can lead to lots of uh, cost reduction. Let's say you are running tens of thousands of ports and workloads and you are also using uh, Istio. In the tradition, Istio, you would have exactly the, the, the exact same amount of sidecars running next to your applications. You would need to um, calculate with those sidecars and their resource usage when you were doing capacity plan uh, planning. And at a certain scale, uh, you can really feel the, the text of Istio um, that you could, that you have to pay. Um, but, uh, but you obviously got some really good and nice features uh, for your money. But some people, and I, as I mentioned, this was really uh, a thing at scale, uh, were a bit concerned about uh, cost, uh, the attached cost of running sidecars everywhere. Um, but what is even more important is that it can simplify operations. Another problem that many team uh, had with Istio was uh, was the actual fact that they, they had to operate it. Um, if you would had a clear separation between ops people and dev people, then the dev people would be probably be a bit happier with Istio itself because they were not necessarily the ones managing, operating it, upgrading it. Back in the day, Istio upgrades were, were not that great. I started to document all those upgrades on my blog and um, most of those upgrades, I don't know, three years ago were, were quite exciting and uh, always provided good content for my blog. Now, I, I haven't blogged on Istio upgrades for, I don't know, since since a long time because nothing happens, everything just works. And that was even before Istio Ambient. So I think if someone tried Istio out and it was not that great, then I think they should they should definitely try it, try it out again because especially with ambient mode, it's so much easier and simpler and uh, and better in any way. Um, but yeah, back to the back to the simplified operations part. Um, one of the reason that people also found problematic is that after they upgraded Istio itself, the control plane, uh, you need to perform a rollout restart to all of your applications so that those can get the new sidecars and those can connect to the Istio control plane uh, again. Uh, depending on what kind of organization structure you might have, um, you could do it yourself if you were part of a team that had full control over everything uh, in, in your uh, cloud native uh, landscape. But we have also customers who are doing things differently and they have a different distinction between their platform team and all the other applications team. For example, there's one example in um, Germany, one of our biggest European customers. They have, they are managing almost 20 clusters, all of them running with Istio and uh, their platform team who are we working with are only responsible for the, for the platform itself. So after they do some change on the Istio control plane or the actual infrastructure, all the actual uh, developer teams needs to redeploy their, one of their applications. They cannot just roll, roll out, restart everything. Um, this has its benefits and, um, and disadvantages, of course, but this is something that in this case, the platform team is pushing to the developers. Um, they can dictate that, okay, after this, you need to do that. And uh, that's not the best uh, user and developer experience. With ambient mode, you can forget about this because um, you don't have sidecars. 
you have layer 4 and layer 7 components for different reasons. I will go through about those different uh, use cases. But you can forget about sidecars. You can just deploy still. You can just label a namespace with the ambient label and put your application in that namespace. And that's it. After that, um, you would benefit from all these arithmetic capabilities, uh, but without sidecars. And uh, now I will show you how you can do that. So this is the layer four uh, architecture of a communication between pods uh, in its two ambient. You can see that you have two nodes, and uh, these are nodes in a Kubernetes cluster. You have six pods running uh, on top of them. You can see that there's that green box that's the Z tunnel. The Z tunnel is the zero trust tunnel that is running on all the nodes that you have in the cluster as a daemon set. The daemon set is running on all the nodes, so um, it's uh, as simple as that. Um, and basically, just purely uh, the Z tunnel daemon sets, uh, daemon sets can provide you MTLS, cartographic identity, and layer for um, telemetry and observability, access logs, even traces, it can add additional spans, um, and, and metrics uh, for, your, for your traffic. You can see that how the traffic flows. For example, when pod A and B wants to talk to uh, D and E correspondingly, you can see that the traffic will be intercepted by the, by the Z tunnel. It will go through that yellow tube. That yellow tube is the h bone protocol. Uh, it doesn't necessarily to uh, deep dive into what the h bone protocol is. You can go to istio.io and under ambient, you can find some information on that. But that's basically the secu secure um, uh, layer four overlay network that will provide uh, mutual TLS and kind of identity for your workloads. Um, this slide illustrates that you have another, you have a dedicated um, H1 tunnel for all the all the different communications happening between pods. Uh, but basically, that's it. This is why you don't need sidecars. If all you need is MTLS and some layer four visibility and some basic layer four routing, then you just do what I said and uh, deploy. If still in ambient mode, put your application in the same namespace and it will just work. You don't even need to restart your applications. Um, that's it. If you want to do some layer seven processing, then you have a slightly different um, architecture. The daemon sets, uh, the Z-tunnel daemon sets are still there, but in the middle, there's a waypoint proxy. The waypoint proxy is the layer seven component. You can think of the waypoint proxy as the sidecar, but it's not a sidecar, but another component. That's basically like an ingress gateway, but for um, for layer seven uh, service to service communication. You can see that you still have MTLS, you still have HBone, you have uh, those before reaching uh, the waypoint proxy, and uh, and yeah, that's how the traffic flows in ambient. I forgot to mention, but, uh, but Z tunnel is something that uh, we and Google uh, originally created for uh, Ambient itself from scratch. So that's a very efficient uh, component written in Rust. Um, it has as minimal responsibilities as possibly uh, possible, so that it can be pretty lightweight. It's also written in Rust, as I mentioned. So it's uh, it's a quite simple and uh, and performant component while the Waypoint proxy is still using Envoy. Envoy is the proxy technology that uh, that you traditionally have in Istio for the ingress and for uh, the sidecars as well. Um, and also what you can use out of the box with Ambient, but Ambient provides an option to bring your own Waypoint so that you can use another layer seven gateway to have more API gateway-like features, more enterprise features uh, on that spot. But out of the box, you get a regular Envoy, uh, just like you would have uh, with, uh, with the Ingress gateway in, in, in open source Istio. And we arrived to the, uh, to the last piece, Envoy itself. 
which is the de facto uh, cloud native layer 7 proxy. You can see how many companies are using that. It was originally created uh, at Lyft uh, in the US. Uh, it's part of the CNCF, just like the other uh, technologies as well. It has a very uh, large and vibrant and diverse uh, community. It was created for the challenges that you can have in a Kubernetes cluster, uh, in a Kubernetes environment. You have uh, dynamic services coming up, going down, scaling out, scaling up. Uh, you have lots of um, movement in your cluster, and Envoy was created with this dynamic nature of reconfiguration uh, in mind from scratch. Um, yeah, the way you can extend Envoy is that you can have filters and basically you can have a filter chain where you can put multiple filters after each other and with these you can extend um, the capabilities of, of one Halo Envoy. Um, you can see some examples and the more interesting ones are for example Redis, MySQL, Kafka, these are the non-standard uh, protocols or, or tools that your proxy might need to communicate in a cloud native environment if you have a message queue or a, I don't know, database uh, you um, managed by a cloud provider, then having a gate, then having a layer 7 proxy that can understand that protocol and you can you can shift traffic there and do canary releases and have metrics is, is a game changer. It also provides telemetry data, so you can have logs, metrics, and traces for all of your traffic requests. And uh, yeah, it's a quite popular uh, layer 7 proxy. This is also, this is why also all the other uh, projects are using it behind the scenes. I forgot to mention, but even Cilium is using Envoy for all the layer 7 stuff that they are doing. Um, there's this slight confusion in how much ABPF uh, that is in, in Cilium. eBPF is there for some low level stuff, but uh, the layer 7 policies and capabilities are actually um, uh, uh, managed by an Envoy uh, that they are packaging. Um, this is Glue Gateway, our open source uh, project. Um, it's a cloud native API gateway that adds additional capabilities on top of Vanilla Envoy. Why this is great is that not sure if has anyone tried to configure Envoy uh, directly, like raw configuration into an Envoy pod? Yeah, what was your what was your experience? Not too great. <laughs> not too great. Yeah, the an, an Envoy config up can be multiple thousand lines of code, and it's very very hard to troubleshoot or 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 change things there or understand how all the filters are 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 going together. So this is why most projects are providing a simplified API that you can uh, that can simplify this while still having the benefits of using a highly customizable uh, base uh, Envoy instance. Actually, still is also doing this. There's Envoy behind the scenes, but you are not configuring raw Envoy in Istio uh, if you are lucky. You are just using the abstractions of Istio and making uh, making everything simpler. So we did the same with uh, with Envoy. So this is our uh, open source gateway. There's also an enterprise version with additional enterprise features, but the OSS version is also, I think, really great, and you can integrate that with the rest of the uh, ecosystem. It's also using the Kubernetes Gateway API. Um, who is using Kubernetes Gateway API? Maybe some some people already started to. Yes, I see one uh, person um, for this question. Uh, the Gateway API is what's the new way to do um, layer 4 and layer 7 routing in a Kubernetes cluster. Not many people are using it at the mom uh, moment, but it's becoming more and more um, more and more popular. And at, after some point, the ingress uh, resources will be probably deprecated. This is why M uh, Istio's ambient mode is also uh, using um, Kubernetes Gateway API as first class citizen and most of the tutorials that you can find for Ambient are using uh, Gateway API to help to have the adoption because after some point you will have no other choice but to use this one. Um, what is great about this is that, again, I started this talk talking about platform engineering and building, building 
uh, and connecting building blocks for a cloud native uh, networking stack. And the Gateway API is a great fit for that uh, platform because you can see that how um, persona driven and how customizable it is. You can see that there are various CRDs and Kubernetes APIs, Gateway Class, Gateway HTTP root, for example. So for example, if you have a platform engineering team and uh, they are providing the platform itself, the infrastructure, then they might be working with Gateway Class. Uh, you can break this into two, two uh, other roles where you can have dedicated cluster operators. They might be provisioning gateways. The actual developers are most of the time are just thinking about HTTP routes and TLS routes because they are mainly responsible for exposing their application and their APIs. They don't necessarily want to focus on gateway class. So you can see that how personal driven the whole API uh, behind, uh, behind Kubernetes gateway, I, gateway API is. Um, this slide simplifies the definition itself. It can cover layer four, layer seven, it's extensible. And the last point is really interesting. It can provide uh, capabilities for ingress, egress, load balancing, and service mesh. And this is how everything uh, integrates. Because if you remember this slide um, from the ambient uh, section, then originally in the middle as the waypoint that was a waypoint proxy, but you can even use a glue gateway or another gateway that is implementing the Kubernetes gateway API because it is the same sets of API. So you can even use an additional more advanced um, API gateway as your waypoint, <clears throat> which is a really nice thing to do because why would you want to use two different sets of APIs and Kubernetes CRDs if you can just use a, a simplified, unified, and single API that can manage all of your application networking um, challenges. And this is the same problem that we uh, as Solo.io are also solving with our platform. We really believe that you should only be using a single API for anything application networking related to, to make it really simple. You can even try this out. I don't have a QR code for this, but you probably don't want to watch GitHub repos on uh, on your phone. But uh, as I heard, there's also an application for GitHub. I haven't uh, tried it yet, uh, but it's a quite simple um, shortened URL. You can go to this and that will, that will uh, take you to our GitHub repository that hosts our workshops. And uh, you can try this. Everything is open source and OSS in this repository. You can see how you can you how you can deploy ambient, how you can expose applications running on ambient, uh, and use the glue gateway OSS proxy as the waypoint proxy to have additional capabilities. We also have really nice labs that are showing how you can integrate everything with Argo CD, how you can do phase rollouts. Um, how you can integrate open telemetry in the picture so that you can you can also observe what's happening in the cluster. Uh, I think this is this is really great. And uh, if you are interested in the the future of application networking, then this is something that you should definitely take a look at. So um, I don't think I will have too many time for questions, but this was the uh, the cake the cake stack. And I even try to complete it into into a, a stack. I didn't use AI, but I think you can tell because it's I don't know, <laughs> it's uh, it's not the best cake ever. Um, but yeah, thanks for coming to this talk. These are the summary points. Um, use today's tools for for today's problems. Use healthy OSS uh, projects as a foundation because these are. These are not single vendor backed uh, projects. If, if a single vendor goes away, your project might die and there you are with a platform that you built on top of something that you cannot maintain anymore. That's not great. Uh, don't reinvent the wheel and most importantly, don't reinvent security. If there are secure and uh, standard solutions to do security, then you should, you should use that. And yeah, the modern uh, cloud native networking stack is here, and uh, and you can you can get started with it. Uh, you can go to um, solo.io 
or uh, even uh, yes that's our slack that you can that you can uh, you join and ask questions on these technologies and there's also academy.solo.io where you can find free and very quality um, workshops on all of these technologies Cilium, Envoy, Ambient, Istio, uh, eBPF we still have some eBPF uh, workshops there everything is free all you need is a browser, and in the browser you can have Kubernetes clusters, you can have eBPF. Um, you, it's 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 a really nice platform. And uh, yeah, don't forget to join our Slack if you have any questions. Thank you. And uh, I don't think I have questions, so feel free to to catch me after the talk, and more than happy to answer.